Amazing, so. Oh, my God, the other one's dropping by. Oh, yeah, but I, it, it's not quite ready to unmold. Let's see. We want to hold it and I'm going to unmold it. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Got to see if Paige hopefully will be joining us momentarily. I'm not putting on video because I don't feel like being seen. <laughs> we can hear you though, Dick. difficulties here so my apologies um how are you very good thank you Paige wonderful I'm sorry I apologize I'm just having some issues with my internet so um if I could just can I ask everyone to bear with me for two minutes I may just need to switch my room I don't know what's going on here but I, I promise I will be right back I'm so sorry <laughs> Maybe we can take the moment to say hello to everybody. It's lovely to see everybody. 
Good to see you, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Is everyone ready for Christmas? <laughs> Bill, thank you all for the cookies. That was so sweet oh, of you. Oh, you're, wel you're welcome. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Hey, good to see you there. You're so sweet. Hi, all. So my very much apologies that I'm having some internet issues, but I think I should be fine. So uh, why don't we, Merrick, I don't know if you wanted to just go ahead and get started. Um, sure, sure, we're delighted to see you, Paige. And I'll, I'll just a brief introduction is, I think all of you know now that um, Paige is a, uh, excuse me, I've got to let people in as we do this. Um, Paige is an adjunct <laughs> professor in art history at the Department of Columbia University and also an educator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where she gives gallery tours of special exhibitions and the permanent collection, teaches membership classes, and leads trips with the travel with the MET program. And we're hoping that she'll be able to lead us on uh, some field trips as well in the future, and we'll tell you more about that moving forward. Um, but I first learned about Paige through Audrey Schaus, one of your friends, who said, I have this friend who's an incredible art historian and lecturer. And so that's how this all began. And I believe this is your third or fourth time with us. And we're looking forward just to as many times as you'd be willing to, to share with us in the future. So thank you, Paige, for joining us. We look forward to hearing about Madonna's Miracles and Magi. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you, Merrick. And again, my apologies that I'm having some issues and hopefully I won't be interrupted uh, during our talk. The joys of technology in the modern age. Uh, but I wanted to actually, uh, first of all, thank Merrick for having me back and thank all of you for being here and to wish you a happy holiday and amazing that I've actually been nine months in Zooming. And I think you all were actually one of my first Zooms back way back in the day. Uh, but what I'd like to do is share my screen and head to the topic of today's lecture. Now, when I was considering uh, the concept of the nativity, uh, which is a rather large topic, um, I decided that I wanted to focus in more on the idea of the Magi and thinking about the Magi as um, an interesting element in the story of the nativity. So what I'd like to do today is trace the history of the Magi. I, I kind of diverted a, a small bit from my original topic, uh, but to think about the history of these three kings and the role that they play in this very important moment um, in the birth of Christ. So the topic, the title of my talk is capturing the adoration of the kings in art. Um, from the early Christian era to the Baroque, and really thinking about the role that the kings had played um, in this very uh, singular moment. Uh, and I think the interesting thing, I call them the kings, but they really are more the magi. And the actual concept of the magi came, comes from only one small phrase in uh, the Bible that comes from Matthew 2, 11. Um, and it reads as such, and when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And that is really the bulk of what we know about these three individuals. Um, and so what I'd like to do is really trace their history um, from an early era in which they were considered Persian mystical uh, wise men, um, and then move into the moment where they are understood more as kings um, and in their ability to show the sense that all of the world has come together to worship Christ. Um, and so what I'd like to do is really start with this image, which is actually, I'm gonna be showing you a great number of images. I apologize, I had a very difficult time in wheedling th these down to my particular favorites. Uh, but this image by Botticelli, and we're gonna sort of see Botticelli as the culmination in many ways of the um, adoration scene. He paints over seven of these during the course of his lifetime. Um, and this one in the National Gallery in Washington I think is the most spiritual in nature um, and also gives us a wonderful image of the three kings here that you see. Now, um, originally, as many of you know, the um, Mary 
gives birth to Christ in Bethlehem in the church of the nativity, which you see here. Uh, I have to confess, I have never been to the church, sadly, uh, but those of you who have possibly made the pilgrimage will know that uh, when you enter into the church, you see the upper altar and then you make your way down into the grotto. So um, in that sense, the idea that Christ was literally born in a cave um, is something that's been changed artistically over time. Uh, but the, it makes sense if Christ were to be, if, if Mary were to be sent somewhere, she would be sent somewhere that was warm, the cave, the grotto would have been the warmest place in the inn or in the stables, wherever um, exactly this took place. But this is actually um, a church that was created by uh, Constantine in the era of Constantine. Actually, I shouldn't say created, I should say founded um, by his mother, Helena, who went to uh, the Holy Land uh, during the time of Constantine. She really was the reason behind his conversion. Um, and he decided he had a dream that if he fought with Christ's uh, crosses on his shield, that he would actually win this victory, which he did. And with that, he converted to Christianity. But Helena was really the woman behind all of this. And she went to the Holy Land and really made it her mission to find these places, uh, places in which um, the various scenes of the life of Christ took place. And she went to Bethlehem and basically consecrated the space and the church was constructed. Uh, and so from that, the concept of Christ the um, idea of the nativity set in Bethlehem um, comes essentially from this particular space, but it's been changed quite dramatically over the course of the last 2000 years of art. And we first start to see images of the Magi um, in sarcophagus reliefs. So this is really a point uh, in time when the Romans are starting to convert to Christianity. And you see a lot of imagery on sarcophagi that actually relates back to earlier types of images during the pagan era. And we call this in art history, we call this syncretism. And this is in uh, the concept of taking previous imagery and adapting it for a more Christian theme. So you see in statues of Zeus, these images become God. Statues of Apollo, these images become Christ. And in this particular case, the motif of barbarians bringing offerings to the emperor actually then becomes translated into an image of these three men, these three wise men. But they are not considered kings as such yet. These three wise men are coming from the East, generally accepted to be coming from Persia, and they carry with them wreaths. And the idea is that in the pagan era, when uh, barbarians came to pay tribute to the emperor, they gave them, and to also recognize his power, they gave him a wreath. And so this concept basically was translated um, into a Magi scene. And I love this particular image because you see the camels <laughs> coming out from behind. And then you also see the first of the Magi pointing to the star and essentially kind of recognizing this star as the, the, the star in the east, the star that brings them to Bethlehem that they follow to find um, the Christ child. And you'll notice also that the Christ child does not look like a child, actually looks very much like an adult. So it takes quite some time for this Christ child to appear as an infant that will come a little bit later um, as we move more into the early Renaissance period. So this is another example, the dogmatic sarcophagus these can all be found in Rome. Um, and these are images of the three kings, yet again, in their Phrygian caps and their trousers. So they're entire, they're wearing their, the um, attire of the East, and they're bringing again with them the frankincense, myrrh, and gold. Uh, the gold is often shown as a golden wreath at this particular time. And then behind you have um, a man named Balaam, who was actually a prophet um, from the Old Testament, who foretold about the star of Jacob. Um, and so it's in a sense, it ties together aspects of um, the Old Testament and the New Testament into one particular image. And you can see more and more of these on sarcophagi. Sarcophagi, because they have long horizontal, um, they're long horizontal structures, it was more of an appropriate scene for a type of a procession or a type of, of uh, arrival scenes. And here again, you have these images with the 
camels popping out, um, again, pointing to the star with the wreath. So this was something that was a very predominant theme in the early Christian period. And you even see it on gemstones. This is actually a very rare gemstone uh, from the Ashmolean collection found by Sir Arthur Evans. And here you see the three kings coming and bringing their offerings to the Christ child with um, Balaam again behind pointing to the prophecy of the star. Um, again, as we start to engage with um, more sophisticated imagery, we get into um, these early medieval frescoes that are in Castel Seprio. Um, you can see now that the star has been transformed into an angel. And that's going to happen often in these early images. The star and the angel seem to both represent this um, the, the, the spiritual image in the sky. And this, of course, comes from Matthew 2.9, thinking about how the um, kings were brought to um, Bethlehem. When they had heard the king, they departed. This is when they went to Herod. Uh, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now, you may recall in Matthew's um, recounting, uh, the kings are see the star in the east. They are brought to uh, the Holy Land. They go to Herod. They tell Herod about the star, and they ask about this king. And Herod has heard that a child has been born, or to be been born, has been born in Bethlehem, and he sends them there. And of course, tells them to come back and report on what they've learned. Uh, they never do, and then of course that results in the massacre of the innocents. But it's the star that guides these particular, that, that guides the wise men, and the star can be shown again as an astral image or also as as an angel. Now we start to get into um, some other types of interpretations of the adoration of the Magi. And here you actually see Christ almost as a grown man in many ways. This is right after the Council of Ephesus and there's a new emphasis on the majesty of Christ. And so you see here the, the three men, the three kings arriving with their gifts, um, the virgin off to the left. Um, you can always identify them in these early years with their Phrygian caps, right? And their trousers. So they are still Persian wise men. And then behind you have the four um, figures from the gospel. And there's the star of Jacob, right? As prophecy by Balaam. So it's kind of this bringing together of Old Testament and New Testament. But here the Christ child no longer a child, in fact, looks very regal. And of course, the, imp the importance of the purple color, the purple dye in this particular sort of seated throne makes him look um, ex exceptionally maj majestic. You'll also see next to him a Sybil. And Sybils were very important individuals in pagan Rome. The Sybil uh, was a female prophet. And many of the, if you're familiar with the Sibyl of Delphi, she's the one who says, know thyself, or the, the, they're very famous Sibyls on the ceilings of Michelangelo's um, uh, Sistine Chapel. Um, so the, the Libyan Sibyl, or um, the, um, the, there, there are a number of large figures, they're women. And basically what these women do is they prophesied um, events in the pagan world, but a lot of those prophecies were then translated into a Christian story. So the Cumaean Sibyl prophecies a virgin birth of an important leader. And so the Christian group basically, it's been part of this syncretism, uh, basically take those readings and translate them into a Christian story. So you see the Cumaean Sibyl here, the prophecy of the Christ child has actually occurred. Uh, now, the most important in early images of the three kings really come out of Ravenna. And if you've never been to Ravenna, it's an absolutely magnificent city. Um, it uh, was the um, head of the church um, in the um, period of um, Justinian. It has phenomenal examples of mosaics. And these mosaics were really a uh, means by which to not only tell biblical stories, but also to um, 
also to give you imagery um, relating to various identities of individuals. And this is actually the first time where we get the names of the three kings spelled out. So Balthazar, um, who was, uh, and initially these three kings were all seen to be coming from Persia, but later the concept of these three kings suggested not only um, people from foreign lands, but people from different continents, people from um, a, a, a one individual representing peoples from Africa, one individuals representing people from Asia, and one individual representing peoples from Europe. Um, and so Balthazar was often recognized as the individual coming from Africa, um, Melchior from Asia, and Gaspar from Europe. And you basically see the three of them here coming with their various offerings, again, the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Um, and they're still in their Phrygian caps. And of course, here we have the image of the Virgin uh, with the child seated in her lap. We call this the throne of majesty. And you're going to see this repeated uh, frequently in the medieval era. But here you have the three kings, and it's really quite a fantastic example of Ravenna um, mosaics. Mosaics are made from small tesserae, small pieces of glass that are placed side by side. So tremendous amount of workmanship, craftsmanship. It's really an exceptional example of this um, Byzantine style. And uh, the, um, it was a capital of the church for a very brief moment when there was this transition from Rome to Constantinople, uh, but the, um, the Ravenna mosaics are, are legendary um, in, their, in their style and also in their artistry. Uh, so essentially, we start to continue to see images of the three kings in different types of medium. So here I'm showing you a plaque from the British Museum, uh, and that's actually a plaque that was made of ivory. Um, they're always now very concerned about how we show ivory. Uh, in any case, this is an example of an early piece. Um, people are very sensitive to the ivory trade in, in today's contemporary world, but this was a piece that dates back to those frescoes of um, the time period of Ravenna. And you start to see the Virgin shown in what we call the throne of majesty surrounded by the three kings here, still in their Phrygian caps, still in their trousers, um, with an angel holding the cross behind. So in some senses, suggesting what is to come. Um, so um, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. So this is an ampulla, and an ampulla was a very important object, sort of a flask that was used in pilgrimages, pilgrimages to the Holy Land. Um, and many of these ampulla also contain the same image of the the Virgin in Majesty holding the Christ child with the three kings. Again, the angel here pointing to that star, the star of Jacob, but also representing the star of Bethlehem. So the, what I'm trying to kind of give you a sense is whether it's flasks in silver or plaques in ivory or mosaics, this image starts to become very, very widespread in this time period of the early Christian church. And again, um, Many people actually believe some of the images came from mosaics that were in the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. Um, these mosaics were had been very almost practically non-existent and they were restored four years ago. So many people have started to make connections with this restoration, important restoration in the church between these objects from the early period and um, these particular designs. So this is an important moment. This is the Codex Egberti. And so we're now moving to Northern Europe um, in this area era of the Carolingian period. Um, and what's happened here, um, this is an illuminated manuscript, yet again, showing you another type of art form, but you have a major shift because now we have kings and you see the kings wearing their crowns. Right, so you, they are met. They are noted here. So here's Gaspar, right? Here's Melchior, and here's Balthasar back here. But now the kings wear regal attire, and they basically come to the Christ Child kneeling. So it's this idea of prostrating themselves. But we start to see this important shift um, away from 
Persian wise men to kings. And of course, what it represented in the time period was the idea that all of the leaders um, within the various states and various countries and various regions throughout the world recognized the power of Christ and that kings would submit to that power of that, 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 that important uh, Christian symbol. So we start to now see this image in much larger forms. Um, so it becomes more of a monumental image. Most of the images I've been showing you previously were relatively small with the exception of some of those mosaics. But now you start to see, for example, in Barcelona, um, this enormous image of the Virgin. Again, it's still a Virgin in majesty. Um, and she's placed in what we call a mandala. Um, and the mandala is intended to convey that you are in a spiritual space. It's almost kind of the a precursor of showing someone in the clouds. Uh, and of course, you see very frontal, um, this image of the Virgin. And of course, here we have the three kings. And now they're dressed as kings, right? You see their crowns, you see the stars, and you see as they surround this virgin um, and Christ child. So this starts to get um, basically uh, interpreted into sculptural programs of cathedrals. So we're now moving into the Romanesque period. Um, and um, the focus of many of the cathedral, um, sculptural cathedral pieces is in France. Uh, and and this is the south portal, the southern door um, of a La Madeleine de Vézelay. Uh, and you see the tympanum, which is the sculpture that is over the doorway, the entrance to the church. Um, and here you actually see um, the image of the three kings. Um, and it's placed above the image of the Annunciation and the Visitation. So there's a narrative that's played out here. And you have to remember, and I always tell my Columbia students, these are sermons in stone. You don't necessarily have um, the ability to read the Bible. Uh, and so this is an opportunity for you to learn the stories. It's, art was very, very important and crucial in this time period from the early Christian era up through the medieval period, because it did allow people to understand the stories. So for example, if you go to Amiens, um, a very famous cathedral in the, um, just about an hour and a half outside of Paris in the sort of Picard region. Uh, this is the virgin portal, the virgin's door, uh, so to speak, uh, which tells the story of the virgin and her, um, basically the Annunciation, the birth, uh, and then later Mary's in the Catholic faith, the idea of the Dormition, the Assumption, and the Coronation. All of those concepts about the Virgin are embedded in this imagery in the uh, doorway. And uh, this is the moment where we call, we call it the cult of the Virgin. And the Virgin becomes this very critical figure who um, has powers that are quite important. She can um, intercede on your behalf with Christ, with God. She can break pacts with the devil. She's a very, very important figure. And as you see here, we call these jams. These are figures that are life-size uh, and they're placed next to Mary again to tell her story. And below her, you see right here, um, are images of Adam and Eve. And these images basically speak to the idea that Eve causes original sin. Yes, Eve is the bad one. <laughs> Eve takes the blame. And essentially, um, it is Mary who comes back and redeems the sins of Eve. So essentially, you always kind of see these connections between Mary and Eve. And then on either side of the doors, you see the three kings. So here are the three kings coming, having met Herod here on the left, to see the Christ child. Then on the right side, again, the other stories of Mary, um, the Annunciation, um, the visitation uh, with um, Elizabeth, her cousin who's pregnant with John the Baptist, uh, and also um, the presentation in the temple. So the early stories of the Christ child shown here. And then what I wanted to add though, is that also in many of the images that relate to scenes of the adoration of the Magi, you'll also see Solomon, with the Queen of Sheba. And this is really interesting. So this of course happens in the Old Testament. The Queen of Sheba comes from what we believe to be Ethiopia um, to meet with Solomon and to gather ideas, you know, learn from him. It, she later on gets a bit of a 
bad rap um, as being a seductress. But initially, she's coming to 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 learn the wisdom of Solomon. And uh, you see, here are the three kings, right, with Herod, and then that's Beth, uh, the. Um, Queen of Sheba with um, King Solomon. And that's something that was often seen as a companion piece to the adoration of the Magi. As I said, uh, Balthazar is always seen as the king from Africa and um, generally shown as a black man. And so the Queen of Sheba in many ways is his sort of female, I don't want to say equivalent, but sort of a, 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 a kind of a similar situation, right, of someone coming from, um, from Africa um, to learn more about the Christian faith, or the, the, in this case, the, the Jewish faith. Um, and in this particular, the inscription here, this is this marvelous altarpiece, um, the, the Klaus and Nub altarpiece. And basically, the inscription says that in the gifts, the queen secretly intimates her faith in Solomon. Um, and the idea is that that gets translated then into her faith in Christ, right? So the, the three kings bring the gifts, conveying their faith, and you see the Queen of Sheba doing this as well. So it's just an interesting side that you'll see this Queen of Sheba story brought in frequently kind of as a companion to a sort of an Old Testament, New Testament um, piece. Now I wanted to get to the shrine of the three kings, and I don't know if any of you have been to the Cologne Cathedral. It's a must see, it's an absolute must see, uh, because it is in this cathedral where the relics, the bones, of the three king, of excuse me, of the three kings or the magi really um, have been kept, and it's the largest reliquary in the world. Um, it was another example of Helena. So Helena went to the Holy Land, um, and when she was there, in not only in terms of building important churches and recognizing sites, she collected relics, which were very very important to the church. Uh, so in the, um, the time of uh, Constantine 320, 350, these bones were sent back to Constantinople. Now over, um, and they stayed there for about 800 years. Then they came to Milan because relics, the trade of relics was something that was crucial, not only as something that was very spiritual and a way to connect with these important individuals that you know, were laid in some way to history of Christ or Christianity, but also for pilgrimage. So many pilgrims would come to these cathedrals to get close to these relics. So it was economically quite a boon to have something like this. So in any case, um, there was a war that took place, uh, a war that basically um, Milan was able to win with the support of Cologne. And so as a gift, uh, the Duke of Milan sent these relics to Cologne. Um, and essentially the cathedral, it, the cathedral was took 600 years to complete, uh, but these relics were, were brought and there was this exceptional, and by the way, you still see in the coat of arms of Cologne, the three kings to mark the fact that they have these important relics. Um, but this particular shrine um, built uh, in, it's an exceptional example of goldsmith and metalwork. On the sides, you have images of prophets, you have images of saints and apostles, uh, and then on the, and you can see this a little better here, uh, and then on the front, you have images of the life of Christ. And very important here on the left is the adoration of the kings. And of course, the gemstones sort of suggest the majesty, right, of, you know, the early, uh, this, this, this moment in Christianity. And you can see also, it's a, not a great image, but these are the three kings, now dressed as kings, correct, um, with their gifts, um, giving to the virgin, and then you have Otto, the, the seventh, I think, Otto the seventh or the eighth, who um, was um, a king at the time when this piece was created. So inserting uh, a, a, an important majestic figure to also show homage being paid to Christ in that way. So the, the living king 
combined with the kings from the east, the kings from you know the, the past, the kings from history, sort of bringing them together um, in this very wonderful way. This is a little bit better than image. You don't see Otto over here, but you do see the kings, and these are the gemstones. It's really quite in the cameos. It's exceptional. If you ever get a chance to go to Cologne, you cannot miss it. It's the most. It's sort of the pride of um, of the the church. Now, what you start to see in the 13th century is the impact of, Christ, of, French, of Franciscan piety. So as you know, St. Francis is an uh, important saint who actually conceives of the concept of the nativity scene in many ways, he's credited with that, was someone that felt very important aspect of animals and also the greater sense of humility, right? Um, and so you start to now see um, examples where the kings are on their knees worshiping the Christ child. The, the gifts are no longer as important visually as the positions of the kings and the kings get down on their knees and they humble themselves in front of this child. So you're starting to see more human elements entering into the story. And you can see, this is an early example. This is from the Morgan Library where the king actually kisses the feet of the Christ child. So you're really seeing this engagement with, with a sense of humility on the part of, of these kings. Now we're getting now, we're gonna move back. I've been sort of showing you a lot of pieces from Northern Europe. I wanna get back to Italy um, and some important uh, moments in Italian art, particularly, um, we're gonna get to this in a moment. This is the, um, the altar in, um, uh, in Pisa, but I wanna start out with Giotto. Giotto, if you read Vasari, who writes The Life of the Artist, Giotto is often considered the beginning of the Renaissance. He's often considered to be the first artist that looks back to the Greek and Roman antique style of depicting the body, who engages with a new naturalism and with a new understanding of space and volume. Now it's baby steps because Giotto is coming out of this Byzantine tradition of what I've been showing you, of all the figures being very frontal, very stiff, very hieratic. Remember the mandrela, right? Mary is larger than anyone else, not because she is physically taller, but she's more important. But things start to change with Giotto. And also what you start to see is a new interest in Christ's humanity. So you start to see Christ looking more and more like a baby. Um, and what you'll also notice too is the incorporation of the stable. So up until this point, you really have been seeing Christ, or you've seen the birth of Christ in a grotto, in a cave. He brings out the idea of the stable here. Another element that Giotto introduces that you'll see going forward is rather than the star, which we do sort of see up here, and this is when the, the idea that the star is a comet comes in. This is never in the Bible, it really comes from artists. Uh, but you see this angel, and so in many ways, the angel becomes kind of the stand in for the star. And she sits, she stands right next to Christ and to Mary and to Joseph as um, you see Melchior getting on his knees and kissing the feet yet again in supplication here. And you'll also see introduced in Giotto, you see this a little bit in the past, but you see it generally going forward, the horn. And the horn is what is recognized to hold the frankincense. So that's a very important um, um, object that you'll see in the story. I also love the camels <laughs> who are like, whoa, ah, look at this, isn't this exciting? So this is actually a, a work that comes from, I think one of the most exciting pieces, uh, exciting places um, in early Renaissance painting. This is Padova, this is um, the Arena Chapel. Um, and it was a chapel that was commissioned in the early part of the 14th century on the right side of the um, chapel, you see the story of the lives of Mary, and then on the left side, you see the story of the lives of Christ. And it's a fantastic depiction of this moment leading up to uh, the crucifixion and then the last judgment on the altar wall. But it is also the beginning, as I said, in many ways of Renaissance painting and the engagement with space. Uh, Vasari really does recognize Giotto, but then you do have this this gap for a while. So it takes, takes artists, because of the Black Death, it takes them a while to kind of catch up 
if you will, in that way. Now I wanted to try as much as I could to bring in objects from the Met. Um, this is the Met's adoration of the Magi. This is a very small work. Um, it actually was part of a larger altarpiece that was split up. And this would have been in what we call the predella, which is the images that are on the bottom of the altarpiece that talk about often the life of Christ. We're also interest, inter entering into this Renaissance era where the human element of Christ becomes ever present. In the medieval time period, so much emphasis um, on the uh, last judgment and scenes of the apocalypse and things that are more, one might say, spiritual versus the life of Christ, Christ as an actual human, Christ as an actual young baby. You start to see more and more. And what's so unique about this piece, first of all, you see Giotto conflating the shepherds and the kings. And that also starts to happen around this time with Francis. But also you have a king turning his back towards the viewer. Now, most of the kings are shown in profile, right? But this move, this position is from an art historical standpoint, something quite revolutionary. Never in the past would, the, would, would anyone turn their back. It would always be, you know, that hieratic sense of the large virgin and then everybody in their place. But this is showing you movement. This is showing you Giotto's understanding that the body bends and turns. And so it really is an incredibly important example of an artist that's becoming engaged with naturalism, right? And you can start to see a foreground, a middle ground, and a background. Now that may not seem like anything terribly revolutionary to you, but compared to what we've been seeing with those very flat surfaces in the medieval world, this is really a game changer and Giotto brings it around. Um, and you start to see that in many of these artists from this very early early, sort of late, late medieval, early, early Renaissance period like Tadeo Gaudi, where you start to see just a few figures, right? Just a few figures. Um, but you have now the king, you know, down on his knees, kissing the feet. So you start to see these same similar um, types of motifs. But you have Mary here, not in a manger, not in a stable, but almost more in a home setting. So it's very very interesting. And of course, the, the one king does point up to this star, to this apparition. And this actually relates to a moment that was, it was said that there was almost an enunciation. This is apocrypha. This isn't in the Bible, but um, in the apocrypha in the golden legend, which was a book that everybody read in the medieval ages that supplemented a lot of stories about the Bible, but also brought in a lot of stories of the saints. Um, it was said that there was an angel that almost appeared to the wise men and told them of the Annunciation. So this is kind of this, kind of speaking to that, that image of the child that they had. Um, now, when you move to the north, you see um, still the same, you know, engagement with the three kings on their knees and as kings, but now you start to see the use of the stable, the, main, the, the manger and the stable scene becomes something very popular in Northern Europe. You'll also get a sense too of, the, I love the use of the ermine here, um, which is the the cl clothing of the royals, the ermine, the white fur. Um, it really was because the ermine was seen as something pure and something that would never get itself dirty. So ermine was the, the, the royal fur and you really get this sumptuous dealing of the ermine here. But what's interesting too is Joseph. Joseph is a busy guy in the north. In, in the Italian images, Joseph's sort of in, set off in the back, but in the, Europe, in the northern European images, he's always working. He's always he's a carpenter. He's always doing things. And this also kind of references this desire to fill the space as much as you can. So the north is very much behind the south um, in the early part of the Renaissance in terms of spatial understanding. Um, and then you actually see here just another image from the north where we're kind of conflating this idea of an inn, a manger, a stable. It's kind of showing you all the different op you know, different options. Um, and then with the images of David up here. But I want to now get back to Italy. 
Um, and think about this image as such an important um, scene in Italian Renaissance painting. This is an actual pulpit in Pistoia that was made uh, by Giovanni Pisano. And here you actually see in this pulpit an image of the adoration. So here's the Virgin with the Christ child and the King, um, I believe probably Melchior down on his knees um, with the other two shortly behind him. But this is an example and this is the, the suggestion that they're coming from Jerusalem, having met with Herod, and then making their way in this procession. This is the beginning of the interest in the procession, in the retinue. And this will become an important element of all adorations going forward. The idea that it's not just the three kings, but all of the peoples that come with them, suggesting peoples coming from around the world to celebrate the Christ child. Um, so, come on, computer. Uh, this is how the image looks in the larger pulpit. It's right, an incredible example of early Renaissance carving. You, this, this particular individual actually had great impact on Giotto um, and really sort of the predecessor of people like Donatello. So now we're getting into the 1400s, and this really is you know, the beginnings of the Renaissance. And as I said, this is the moment where the concept of the retinue becomes very important because basically what it does is it allows the painter to use exotic aspects of clothing, of fabrics, sort of as a way to show off what he can do and also to impress the patron. So here we have the kings and the virgin, you know, very, very demurely dressed, um, as in comparison to the followers who are coming from the East with, I love their hats and all their exotic costumes. Um, and this was really something that delighted viewers um, in Florence. Now, the reason that these retinue scenes are so popular in Florence really was due to the fact that the Florentines celebrate the Epiphany. On January 6th, which is considered to be the day of the, the King's arrival, they don't come on March 25th, although in the Greek Orthodox, they do. But um, in um, the Roman Catholic faith, they come on January 6th. And so Florence, loving pageantry, loving ceremony, um, the guilds would get together and have this tremendous procession, this tremendous ceremony celebrating the Epiphany. And so artists, I think, at least this is my interpretation of it, had experienced this, this, this ceremony, had experienced this pageantry and wanted to fill their images in the same way. So it leads us to what I think is one of the most unbelievable, this is a painting I actually could have spent an hour just talking about this. Uh, it's one of my favorite paintings in the Uffizi. It's made by a man named Gentili da Fabriano, who uh, was from the north, um, in the north of Italy, and he was brought down to Florence uh, by the Strozzi family to paint this image of the adoration. And you can see it's an incredible altarpiece, very large, um, and you see the procession of the Magi up here coming from Jerusalem, uh, coming from the east, going to Jerusalem, and then going to Bethlehem. And what basically this suggests is that the procession then continues down to the point where they actually encounter the Christ child in the cave. Uh, we sort of have the cave and the inn and the manger all represented at the same time. And then the predella shows you another nativity scene, it's probably the first night scene in uh, European painting, uh, the um, flight into Egypt and then um, the presentation in the temple. But it was a tour de force of what we call international Gothic. So it's really the end of the Gothic and the beginning of the Renaissance. We don't have this spatial awareness of perspective yet. You can see the figures all kind of you know, all sort of placed one by one and some unbelievable animals in here. Look at the monkeys and the, the, the falcons, uh, really exceptional. And, you know, all these marvelous images of horses. And then of course you have the three kings. Uh, this is also fabulous because you start to see recognizable Florentines. Uh, essentially, if you're gonna pay this much money, you're gonna have yourself represented. Um, this is, I think I have a close up of him. This is Strozzi. Uh, I also love this because these are two Florentine women who are actually sort of checking out the gifts. <laughs> I love this. They're sort of like, 
hmm, look at this. I don't know about this frankincense. Um, and uh, this is actually the, so this is the trip to Jerusalem on the northern, uh, the, the, the upper part of the predella. And this is Strozzi the, as a falconer. See him holding this hawk, this goss hawk. Um, so he was the individual, a very wealthy banker um, who had made a great deal of money in Florence. And of course, Florence is known for its banking um, and wanted to really create this over the top piece for his family chapel in Santa Trinita. And not only is it fantastic in its painting, but it's a work of incredible craftsmanship in terms of the goldsmithing. Whoops, I wanna see if I can go back to this. You can see here in this image, the king's stirrups are being taken off his ankles. And these are actually, they are three dimensional pieces that jut out of the canvas and that are actual gold. So it's really a, an, an extreme example of demonstration of wealth. And now we're getting away from this idea of the Franciscan piety and the you know, concern about um, simplicity. And it's really a full on uh, means by which the patron can convey his wealth and his status. Uh, and that's exactly what was driving most of these individuals. Now, we're not gonna let the Strozzi outdo the Medici. So seeing this particular example of um, the Strozzi, the uh, Medici family, uh, here you see Lorenzo, the son, uh, Piero, the father, and Cosimo, the grandfather, were not going to be outdone by this. So they created their own chapel in their palazzo. And they hired Gozzoli to paint this incredible, this is another place, you cannot miss it if you go to Florence, you have to go to this. It's not an easy place to find. It's kind of not on the typical tourist map, uh, but it's in small, beautiful room. It's a chapel, in private chapel in the Medici Palazzo. And it shows the journey of the Magi. They don't ever actually get to see the three, they don't ever get to see the Christ child. And that was intentional because it didn't want to take away from the majesty of those figures. Uh, but what you do see here, as I mentioned, is Lorenzo. Oh, and here's the artist who puts himself in the painter. So there are all these shout outs to people in Florence. Very, very specific. This is Lorenzo Magnifico, grandson of Cosimo de' Medici, riding as the young king. Now, this is also a moment when the kings, I think I mentioned this, were shown as the ages of man, not just from different parts of the world, but also you know, someone who's very elderly, someone who's middle-aged and someone who's young. So he represents the young king and here followed by father and grandfather and other important leaders from different regions in Italy. And then the middle king is actually the um, Byzantine emperor who's come actually over to Florence. There's been a, a, um, a council that's been called to discuss issues, things were going on in the East. So this is actually kind of representing that moment. Um, and of course you have the old king is the patriarch of Constantinople, but fabulous animals and cheetahs and leopards and just exceptionally rich. Now, my other favorite uh, example of the Magi from this period is the Limburg brothers. They made this marvelous, marvelous illuminated manuscript for the Duc de Berry, and they showed this meeting of the Magi in Jerusalem. Um, but what's fun to me about it is you're really not in Jerusalem, you're in Paris, right? You can see Notre Dame, you can see Saint-Chapelle. So they're sort of taking this idea and sort of placing it in their own particular, you know, home hometown. And here again, you can see the three wise men actually meeting the Christ child with this marvelous example of illuminated manuscript um, gold techniques with the star up on the, um, the, 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 the top left with the angels. So this is all kind of happening around the same time. Um, in the North, we're starting to see more of an engagement with the idea of the stable. Um, we see more of the manger and a lot of images that reference the crucifixion after this um, event. Uh, but it really, oh, when I threw this one in, I told you I have too many images uh, because this is actually in the Mets collection. It's an image of the um, wise men being shown the sort of the enunciation 
of the Christ child. And they're also bathing. They're all skinny dipping back here. They're all taking bath, getting ready for their trip. So I love that picture. And I do also like this one in the Met, um, which I think shows you these three ages of man and the idea that the wise men come from all over the world. So um, you have um, here Baltazar now shown as a black man, which he will be shown you know, going forward in the North, um, Melchior from Asia, and then um, uh, Bal um, excuse me, Baltazar from Africa, uh, Gaspar from Europe, and then Melchior for, from Asia. Um, now, finally, we're getting to the fabulous images that you probably know so well that relate to the Botticelli pieces. This is a precursor for Angelico and Filippo Lippi, Adoration of the Magi. Um, it was considered to be the most valuable piece in the Medici household when they did their inventory in 1492. And what I wanted to show you is how Fra Angelico is bringing together those concepts from the North, the Duke de Berry, those manuscripts, and also the idea of the retinues from the things we've seen by Dafra Briano and Gozzoli and bringing them together into this fabulous image that is just all about the beauty of the adoration, the majesty, but also the intimacy, does it all in one image. And these fabulous birds, the peacock, which you'll see Botticelli pick up on later. Botticelli looks at this very closely in the Medici home, uh, which represents the um, universal life. So, you start to see Botticelli. Botticelli is, as I said, the great artist of the, of the adoration. He paints over seven images. This is his earliest one where he's starting out with Filippino Lippi, son of Fra Lippo Lippi, but very much aware of this image, right? Um, and you can see it's believed that Botticelli did the crowd and Filippo Lippi Filippino Lippi did the images of the Christ child and Mary. Um, and it's a marvelous example of the idea that, um, and this was something that starts to become prevalent at the moment, that when um, Christ was born, a major uh, Roman building, a very large um, classical building fell down. And the idea with the new foundation was Christianity and the crumbling Roman pagan world was going away and the Christian world was going to replace it. That was going to be the new foundation. So you start to see these crumbling ruins. You're going to see that throughout um, in Renaissance imagery. And this is arguably, there's so many that uh, are, I would say, the best of uh, the adorations, but this is arguably the most well-known, I would say. This is in the Uffizi, and it shows you Botticelli, and by the way, Botticelli puts in his own portrait here. We call this a repoussoir figure who looks out to the audience and brings the individuals into the work. Uh, and he's basically bringing you in to look at this image of the nativity in a manger, in a grotto, but with the crumbling ruins behind, right? So bringing all those ideas together with the star shining above. Now, Botticelli is painting for the Medici. So we're gonna incorporate, just as we saw in those other images, important images, that basically having the Medici now take the place of the three kings. So in this image, you actually see, well, this is actually De La, De La Gama, who was the patron who actually paid for the painting, uh, very expensive, and he was a money lender as well. Very poor man, son of a barber, makes his way up in Florence because of the Medici, wants to pay tribute to them in creating this wonderful chapel and this wonderful picture. So you see him looking out, so you know he's looking out at the viewer. But you see here the Medici. So up here, as the oldest king, you see Cosimo de' Medici, grandfather. Down below, you see Piero and Giovanni, the two sons of, Gio of, of Cosimo. And then waiting in the wings over on the left is Lorenzo, who's going to then take command. So it's about legacy. It's about family. It's much more about the Medici than it is about the birth of Christ. Although Botticelli tried hard by placing, making the composition with the Virgin at the top, um, it really is all about this family succession. And of course, it's a statement about the artist. The artist now is not a craftsman. The artist is an independent intellectual individual that should be recognized. We don't know who carved a lot of those pieces that I showed you earlier. But now the name Botticelli 
you know, he doesn't sign the work, he can't sign the work. So it's a way of inserting oneself and, and stating, you know, the importance of the painter. Uh, I believe this is the most beautiful of the adorations. This is in the National Gallery in Washington. This is painted when Botticelli goes to Rome. So when he's in Rome, he um, is painting the Sistine Chapel. This is not the ceiling, but the walls. Uh, Lorenzo de' Medici arranges this um, group to come from Florence to paint this for the Pope. So kind of a, they, they had some troubles, they had some disagreements and it was a sort of an, a, a gift. It was a, you know, a peace offering. So when he's in Rome, he starts to really become quite engaged with the spiritual elements of the nativity. And you see here, now we've got the three kings um, in front of Mary, Joseph and the child. And the three kings are so beautiful. I mean, I know that sounds like a kind of a try, but I, I, when you see this, you go to the National Gallery in Washington, you have to see this. Just the faces of these kings, you know, they're no longer wearing, you know, over the top regal robes. They're just in awe of this Christ child. And the faces just give you the sense of the mystery and the power of this particular moment. And I, I just love this, the, the way he then captures young, middle-aged, old, and just the feeling of, 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 of awe, right? Um, at this particular scene. And I will say, if you've never seen it, I threw this in, this is the mumming, the, the Greenwich Academy girls do this um, every year. And I never had girls, so I, but I did get to go see this every once in a while. They did it virtually this year. And I think you can see it. It's a really wonderful, uh, wonderful tradition that they do. So a few more, as I said, he does seven of these. Uh, this is in the National Gallery in London thinking again about the idea of the ruins, the Roman ruin being replaced by the Christian foundation. And here again, we've got that massive peacock suggesting the concept of eternal life, right? And then interestingly, at the end of his life, Botticelli, you may be familiar in Florentine history, Savonarola comes in and he takes oh, power from the Medici. And this is the bonfire of the vanities and basically, really, you know, speaking to the Florentine people that they are damned, that they are never going to be able to, you know, um, become, go to heaven if they're engaged in all this obsession with wealth and desires. They have the bonfire of the vanities. And Botticelli becomes a strict follower of Savonarola. And as you know, Savonarola is ultimately tried and hung by the New Republic of Florence. Um, and what you're actually seeing down here are angels of mercy kissing Savonarola and his followers. So it's almost a sense of redemption for um, those leaders and what they had done to Florence. A really fantastic image. I mean, as I said, Botticelli, so interesting, you know, the painter of the birth of Venus in Primavera, the two most pagan images in the history of art, goes and has this conversion and then wants to bless Savonarola in his imagery. So ultimately, Leonardo, most important unfinished painting in the history of art, looks at Botticelli when he's commissioned to create this image for a confraternity in Florence. Now, initially the painting, and we know this, so he's looking absolutely directly at Botticelli and he knew Botticelli. They worked together in the workshop of Verrocchio. Uh, and he was aware of how well Botticelli had done with the Medici. And so he's trying to kind of follow in his footsteps. Initially, the painting was going to have 60 figures. It was going to be the most unbelievable, this is the infrared that was at the Leonardo show of the painting, um, which showed you his attempt initially to have even more figures than what is in the final unfinished painting. But he was so obsessed with the movement of limbs and gestures. You'll notice not any figure in this painting has a similar gesture. They're all looking in different ways. They're all engaging in this moment of excitement. This is kind of the retinue. This is the, the feast of the epiphany. Um, and you can actually see, like Botticelli, Leonardo on the right-hand side. So inviting people in, in that way. Now, just to kind of give you a little sense of where this goes. So we go to Tish, we go to the, 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 the Venetians and you start to see colore, color and oil paint becomes such a critical element in the way that these artists engage with painting in new styles. In, in Florence, it's disegno. 
right? It's drawing, it's draftsmanship, it's perspective, it's understanding space and volume and all of these things in very, very detailed form. The, the Venetians are more free flowing with their interpretations. And essentially you'll see Titian using the brush, using new types of paint, using lights and darks in new ways to really make this story his own with a very representative style of this, this colori artist from Venice. My personal favorite of the Venetians is Veronese because Veronese is is a producer, he's a director. He makes this grand scenes and look at not just one angel, but look at the putti as they fall down from this ray of in tremendous light. And again, the costumes, it's something that, you know, you think he's it's almost putting on a production, very, very engaged with, with the theatrical, right? And that's a classic sort of style that you'll see in Venetian art. I love this one by Durer. Uh, because it's actually a self-portrait. Uh, this is, Durer at that point, been known as an engraver, as, a, um, as, as someone that was much more of a, you know, someone that was engraved in, involved with printing. And this was the first, other than his self-portraits, this was the first painting that he really kind of marks his, makes his mark as um, someone that can not just do engraving, but also paintings. And I, I love the image of the self-portrait. And then again, of course, you have uh, always prominent in the north, um, the black king um, from Africa. Um, Rubens, Baroque, now again, thinking of Veronese, he takes from Veronese. What I love about this whole theme is how one artist takes from another, how one artist will look back in the past, take all the things that they've learned and then add their own personal flair to it. So of course, you've got Rubens here, really engaging with this Baroque style, lots of diagonals, lots of movement overwhelming sense, again, of the theater, of the drama, um, and of these kings as they come. And now we're, you know, the Christ child is fully 100% a, ch a child at this point. You see Rembrandt working at the same time period, just after Rubens, the use of the light here to shine in this very humble, I think, scene, uh, but the use of light showing the spiritual moment as this king puts down his turban, and greets the Christ child. You got to remember we're in Amsterdam and there are people coming from all over the world to Amsterdam. So, so, so uh, Rembrandt's familiar with the costume. He's familiar with the attire. He's familiar with the textures, but he's also using this amazing light to show you this moment. And then finally in Spain, I love these images because I think they kind of in a way go back to almost the early Christian images of simplicity, where it's Diego Velasquez just showing you the three kings, the Christ, Mary, and Joseph, and really giving you the sense of simplicity. I love this picture too, because this is his father-in-law, who was his teacher, Pacheco, and this is his wife. So he inserts the family, and some people think that this was one of his daughters. He inserts the family back into the image for something that's very personal. Now, I apologize, I got a little bit of a late start. So what I'd actually like to do is finish this at the Met, where I would really prefer to have all of you um, with our Christmas tree. Now, this is a tree that's been a wonderful tradition since the 1960s. Uh, it was given to um, the Met uh, by um, a, a wonderful woman um, who basically, what, Loretta Hines Howard, um, she was someone who had grown up as a child in Naples. She spent a lot of time in Europe with her family. She was an artist. Uh, later, she worked with Robert Henry, and she started to collect these marvelous figures. Um, and they're terracotta figures between 12 and 15 inches, over 233 of them. And every year um, until her death in the 1980s, and her daughter and granddaughter have continued to do this. They actually just had to stop last year, but um, they come and they would decorate the tree. And they'd start with the angels and they would work their way down to the crash. Uh, and what it really is, it's interesting that these are objects that were made in Naples in the 18th century by very, very well-recognized carvers. And essentially the women, the aristocratic women of Naples would then create outfits for these angels. Um, and you can see here in the crash, you can see there's Mary and Joseph and uh, one king over here, another king 
here and then the king over here. So the, the, the magi are certainly represented, but it's a bringing together of angels and shepherds and animals is an absolutely wonderful, um, I, I think, um, installation. Uh, that's um, something that's been a, tr a real tradition at the Met. So what I want to do, and again, I'm sorry, I'm going over. Um, I want to show you, it's it's not a great recording. I used to always work uh, at the event where they lit the Christmas tree at the Met. So what I'd like to do is transport you back to a couple of years ago to the lighting of the tree uh, to just sort of hopefully place you and kind of, you know, transport you to the museum. So I'm going to stop my share here. Um, and if you bear with me for one second. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. All righty. As I said, it's not the, the tape. The tape is not as great as I'd like it to be, but best we can do. So this is the lighting of the Christmas tree at the Met. Come on, open up. Okay, so wait, I'm stop. Hold on, sorry. Uh, stop that. Sorry. Um, in any case, that was my attempt to take you 
um, to the Met uh, because we can't get there now. But I also just would like to leave you with this message um, of wishing you Merry Christmas. <laughs> so thank you all so much. I apologize for my late start and some of my technical difficulties, but I'd love to answer questions. I know I went a little bit over, uh, but I'm happy to um, answer. I've given you a lot of information. <laughs> as I said, I got very excited about the topic uh, as not only a wonderful way to think about the history of art and the development of the history of art, but also to think about um, the idea of the Magi. And I think also it's an interesting uh, concept because I think it, it talks about how anyone can come and bring gifts and the importance of bringing gifts at Christmas time, um, not just you know, something that's commercial, but you know, an idea of really giving oneself something important and something precious um, in, in memory of this very important spiritual moment. So I'm gonna stop my screen share and see if anybody has any questions. Um, uh, that's so kind, everybody. I did give you a lot of things to go look at. Hopefully you made a bucket list of adoration, the Magi scenes you wanna see for the next uh, 10 years of your life. Um, but I'd love to uh, see if anybody has any questions, comments. Botticelli, Leonardo, early Christian. I have a question. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, first of all. I totally enjoyed your presentation. It was absolutely marvelous, every minute of it. Um, I, I'm just wondering, do you see any religious art now coming out in, um, you know, the art was contemporary for them at the time during the Renaissance. They were right. putting themselves into their art. What, is there anything happening now in religious art? Um, well, you know, it, it, that's a very good question because originally I told Marek, I'd said, oh, let's do Renaissance to the modern era. And I quite frankly started looking around and there really isn't, I hate to say it, but the most contemporary art is extremely secular. Um, so I, I don't really, you don't really see people taking on the subject unless they're referring back to the Renaissance. You know, Andy Warhol does The Last Supper, he refers back to Leonardo. So you right. don't really see... Uh, and I think that's also, that's due to patronage, that's due to the, ch the role of the church. It's also due to the fact that at that time period, it was a very religious society. Uh, right. and, and the church was really the main patron. And, and even if they were individuals, they were making them for chapels, right? So you really don't see that. And I think also there's an issue with today's world. Uh, we're more inclusive uh, you know, it's yeah. well, just yeah. don't want to focus on Christianity. So there is a desire. I mean, even the Christmas tree lighting at the Met, I'm amazed they do it every year because it is a very Christian, it's a very Christian symbol. Um, yeah. And uh, we're trying to be very inclusive now. So um, it, it, it's a little more, the world is getting more complicated. <laughs> but that's why I like the Three Kings because yes. the Three Kings come from all over the world. They represent all ages of man. And they suggest the idea of humbling oneself in front of a spiritual being and giving gifts that recognize the spirit, you know? So I think it's a universal, but, you know, again, I'm not sure everybody would agree with me, but uh, in any case, uh, Ed, that's a great question though. Yeah. Um, there, I can't, in fact, I looked, I really couldn't find anything from the 20th century that I thought was worth showing you. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yes, I have a question, sorry to be um, not on video. I have a question about this kind of, the, the, the depiction of the Magi after the Reformation. The depiction of the Magi after the Reformation. Well, it's interesting because you really don't see in the Reformation, you don't see paintings, you don't see images of, you know, they take the religion out of it. So you're not technically a, uh, allowed in the Protestant faith to create religious imagery. That's why the Anglican in church is interesting because they kind of keep a lot of the Roman Catholicism tradition, but they're Protestant. So you can have more decorative elements in, say, Christchurch than you would in a, uh, a Methodist church, right? Uh, so there's really not um, the Reformation 
the really, you know, Rembrandt does that image of the three kings, but you saw it wasn't about, it was really just more about the virgin and child. Um, so there, there are not that many images in terms of what we think of from the Renaissance, those glorious retinues and all that. You don't see many, much of that in the, the art of the North. There is an image, I, I was going to show you it, but I pulled it by Bruegel that shows you the Reformation. There's that image by Rembrandt, but for the most part, the Dutch painters go to landscape, they go to still life, um, and if they paint images of the, the they'll, they'll show you more um, the life of Christ. So it's, it's, it's less of an em emphasis on devotional kinds of altarpieces like what we saw before. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, thank but you. the real, the better adoration pictures are from Italy. <laughs> I mean, they really bring out all the stops. So I, I think, uh, you know, it's that tradition in the Catholic faith. It's it's a stronger, stronger theme. Thank you. Paige, Rebecca Freddie asks: Was there a certain patron that requested the shift from the wise men to? to the kings. Yes, it was the European patrons that were asking for illuminated manuscripts. So it was the dukes and the kings in Northern Europe that basically were majesty and they wanted to kind of convey the idea that the kings were sort of, so I think I showed you um, one of the illuminated manuscripts. I'm not sure which one, um, the Egberti, that's the first one. That's when you, those are commissioned by local members of the Holy Roman Empire, different sort of, you know, small kingdoms. They want to convey the idea that kings, you know, see Christ as king of kings, right? So that's a good question too. But it's, it's, it's interesting to sort of see that shift to go from Persians to Europeans, you know, all kind of at that at the exact moment that the Holy Roman Empire is kind of coming into its own in that, Carolingian, uh, you know, on a Tony time period. Hey, John, I want to thank you on behalf of all of this. Well, thank you too. Again, as I said, my whole yeah. internet went out <laughs> for like 15 minutes and I was doing all these wires. So if I acted a little bit like flustered in the beginning. Uh, you were great. Sorry. You were great. We're <laughs> so looking forward to doing field trips with you in person and being in the Met with you. So thank you very, very much. This has been an ex exquisite morning oh. uh, you have a wonderful christmas page and all of you who have joined us for this my Number pleasure one. too so thank you all so very much and merry merry christmas to all and be well and be yeah, safe and, be and safe. thank you again Marek, for having me my pleasure. god bless you all bye-bye